So I'm having a discussion on uh, PZ Myers' blog again uh, about, uh, well, I'm really offering theology to biologists and physicists um, and other scientists, but I'm offering theology um, as a sort of self-inquiry into the nature of our own consciousness as human beings. Because that's what I think it is ultimately. So in that sense, theology is also anthropology. It's a study of the human, a science of the human. And the thing is, when you're dealing with the human, you're also dealing with God. You're dealing with the self. You're dealing with the I. You're dealing with these powers of the soul that we have. Thinking, feeling, and willing. Uh, these are not naturalistic in the sense that they can be measured empirically because they're not outside of us. These are what we are. Uh, and so there's a science of the soul and a science of God. But they're not theoretical because you're always participating in and, and creating as you discover in the realm of the psyche or the realm of spirit. So it's fully participatory and we can, when we're doing natural science, lead ourselves to believe that we're not fully participating, that we're observing somehow um, not interfering with what is known, that the object is entirely external to our subject, our observation. Um, but I wanted to, you know, to sort of provide a little bit of more, a little more concrete Actually, it's going to be pretty abstract, but I, I want to read some text um, from a book by Wolfgang Smith called uh, Science and Myth. and It's a chapter on uh, visual perception and neuroscience. Um, and I want to read uh, what Smith has to say about uh, the ecological psychologist J.J. Gibson, who I mentioned in one of my posts, uh, or comments on P.Z. Myers' blog. So I'm going to read uh, one, two, three, three pages here, and then um, I'll discuss what I think this means and how it's relevant uh, afterwards. So Smith writes, Theories of visual perception are subject to empirical verification by way of psychophysical experiments. Typically, a subject is, explo is exposed to visual stimuli designed to stimulate the factors thought to be responsible for the perception of certain parameters. As Gibson observes, quote, in order to study a kind of perception, an experimenter must devise an apparatus that will display the information for that kind of perception. End quote. Different theories of visual perception, however, stipulate different kinds of pertinent information, a fact which in principle renders such theories testable. How, for example, does one perceive the size of a distant object? According to sensation-based theory, the size of the object must be somehow deduced from the primary data given in the retinal image. An assumption which leads quite naturally to the conclusion that the perceptions of size and distance are based upon the laws of linear perspective familiar to artists since the Renaissance. What interests Gibson, on the other hand, are not the shapes and sizes of patches given in a retinal image, but the relations of external objects to each other and to their common ground. Here, then, is one of the early experiments he carried out to test his theory. In a large plowed field without furrows, receding almost to the horizon, 
he planted a stake at distances up to a half a mile and asked observers to judge its size. It is to be noted that linear perspective has been essentially ruled out by the conditions of this experiment. Yet the perceived size of the stake did not decrease with distance, even when the stake was about a third of a mile distant and was becoming hard to see. Gibson writes, quote, the, judge, the judgments became more variable with distance, but not smaller. Size constancy did not break down. The size of the object only became less definite, not smaller. End quote. But although these findings are at variance with sensation-based theory, it appears that Gibson did not consider them definitive. It was not his nature to draw conclusions on the basis of a single experiment. Eventually, however, in light of experimental evidence accumulated in the last 25 years, as Gibson says of himself, he returned to the aforesaid experiment to observe, quote, the implication of this result, I now believe, is that certain invariant ratios were picked up unawares by the observers and that the size of the retinal image went unnoticed. No matter how far away the object was, it intercepted or occluded the same number of texture elements on the ground. This is an invariant ratio. End quote. The perception of size, in this instance, was apparently accomplished by way of a hitherto unrecognized invariant given directly in the ambient optic array, which is Gibson's phrase for uh, the field of, of perception, of visual perception. This brings us to the heart of Gibson's theory. The idea, namely, that perception results from the pickup of invariance given in ambient light. Up till then, it had been assumed that perception is based upon shapes, what cognitive psychologists term forms, first given in the retinal image, an assumption which, which leads, as we have noted before, to a two-stage view of perception. For decades, researchers had investigated what was termed form discrimination by means of psychophysical experimentation. My objection to this research, Gibson writes, is that it tells us nothing about perceiving the environment, end quote. What he means, in effect, is that the research in question relates to the visual interpretation of pictures, of two-dimensional pictorial displays, and to be sure, as such, these studies do provide correct and potentially useful information. The environment, however, is something very different from a pictorial display. And therefore, if we do perceive the environment, as Gibson claims, the optical information upon which that perception is based must differ fundamentally from the optical cues studied by visual image psychologists. The latter point to their success in the investigation of form discrimination as a vindication of their theory, forgetting that, quote, this tells us nothing about perceiving the environment. Well, Gibson's term environment, he's, he, he, he means what Husserl would call the life world, um, you know, our embodied experience uh, of being in the world amongst others, always already wrapped up in all sorts of ethical relationships and, um, you know, having inherited the, this whole past, um, you know, set of relationships and then, you know, constantly being called to, um, you know, bring forth a, a new moment, um, you know, the sort of situation that we were in as human beings in the life world is not at all the same as you know, the, the environment that we inhabit, that we are, that we live in, is not at all the same as this abstract model that uh, scientific materialism constructs for us. Um, and we become susceptible to mistaking the model of a mechanism for our actual experience as perceiving 
beings oriented to a visual re uh, world. Um, so that's what he means by environment or life world. It is evident that visual image psychology employs physical optics based upon rays. As Gibson goes on to point out, quote, this theory of point-to-point -point correspondence between an object and its image lends itself to mathematical analysis. It can be abstracted to the concepts of projective geometry and can be applied with great success to the design of cameras and projectors, that is, to the making of pictures with light. The theory permits lenses to be made with smaller aberrations, that is, with finer points in the point-to-point -point correspondence. It works beautifully, in short, for the images that fall on screens or surfaces are intended to be looked at. But this success makes it tempting to believe that the image on the retina falls on a kind of screen and is itself something intended to be looked at, that is, a picture. It leads, one, it leads to one of the most seductive fallacies in the history of psychology, that the retinal image is something to be seen. Take the image, uh, end quote. Taking the image paradigm at face value, one needs in effect to postulate a little man inside the head who looks at the stipulated image, a notion which leads in principle to an infinite regress that is to say, to an indefinite sequence of little men, one inside the proceeding. On the other hand, if one adopts a more sophisticated approach based upon neurophysiology, one arrives at a correspondence between points of stimulation on the retina and what Gibson terms spots of sensation in the brain, spots, spots which are characterized by brightness and color alone. If so, Gibson goes on. The brain is faced with the tremendous task of constructing a phenomenal environment, a life world, out of spots differing in brightness and color. If these are what is seen directly, spots of differing brightness and color, what is given for perception, if these are the data of sense, then the fact of perception is almost miraculous." End quote. By way of contrast, Gibson goes on to enunciate his own position. Quote, it is not necessary to assume that anything whatever is transmitted along the optic nerve in the activity of perception. We need not believe that either an inverted picture or a set of messages is delivered to the brain. We can think of vision as a perceptual system, the brain being simply a part of that system. The eye is also a part of the system, since, a retin since retinal inputs lead to ocular adjustments and then to altered retinal inputs, and so on. The process is circular, not a one-way transmission. The eye, head, brain, body system registers the invariance in the structure of ambient light. The eye is not a camera that forms and delivers an image, an image, nor is the retina simply a keyboard that can be struck by fingers of light. End quote. It is to be noted that the shift from retinal receptors and afferent nerve bundles to the quote eye, head, brain, body complex, end quote, conceived as a single perceptual system parallels on the side of the perceiving organism the transition from the physical world to the environment, the physical world being the abstract uh, material model, mechanical model that natural science constructs for us, and the environment being the life world of our actual human experience. Um, so it, it is to be noted that the shift from the retinal receptors and afferent nerve bundles to the eye, head, brain, body complex conceived as a single perceptual system parallels on the side of the perceiving organism, the transition from the physical world to the environment. It turns out that the new concept of perceptual system corresponds indeed to a level, quote, appropriate for the study of perception. Uh, I have to do a